barrier to entry okay. as as far as um, real estate investing goes. So that that means two things. That means anybody can do it. <laughs> and the problem with that is that anybody can, anybody do, can it. do it. <laughs> this week's podcast is brought to you by Spartan Invest. Spartan currently manages hundreds of turnkey properties across Alabama and Tennessee and is where I personally bought my first out-of-state turnkey property. In fact, I have two properties with them now and both tenants just renewed for another two years. That should tell you the quality of their team and their due diligence. If you are a first-time investor or are looking to expand your real estate portfolio, check out SpartanInvest.com. Are you tired of the nine to five lifestyle? Do you want more freedom to do what you want when you want it? without sacrificing your current income? Then this is the show for you. Every week, we dive into John's journey towards financial freedom and everything he has learned since 2014. Real estate investing, cryptocurrency, stocks, private lending, foreign residency, tax saving strategies, infinite banking, assets protection, and much more. Now, here is your host, the founder of the Wealth and Freedom Nexus, John Rickgarn. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you're listening to this. This is John Rickgarn, your host, as always, of the Wealth and Freedom Nexus podcast. And today we got a great guest, Stephen Libman, originally from New Jersey, but recently I found out moved to South Carolina. So I'm sure it's a lot warmer than it is here in the uh, balmy tropics of Marshall, Minnesota. Steve actually brings a wide birth of experience and knowledge from the real estate space. Started off as a realtor, like I am now, and moved on to broker and flipper. And then realized as much as I love paying all these taxes to Uncle Sam, I need to do something different. And then moved on to syndication, self-storage, um, and helping other investors uh, with their passive income needs as well. Uh, with that, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Really appreciate you having me. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I know we've kind of talked and had uh, numerous you know, mutual connections in the industry. And glad we finally had a chance to connect here for uh, ourselves and also for my listeners. So maybe you can maybe just start off with, you know, kind of take us back in time and how you or how and when you got started in real estate. Yeah, I graduated college back in 2004. My degree is in sociology from Boston University, so not exactly uh, real estate <laughs> finance. Gotcha. But I <clears throat> got into Manhattan, started doing some sales jobs there, and quickly learned I did not want to work for anybody else. Okay. Okay. Um, and just wanted to kind of be my own boss and work in some kind of sales capacity where um, I'd be able to kind of dictate my own schedule and things like that. Sure. At the same time, my sister-in-law um, opened up a real estate brokerage. This was just after the financial collapse. And ah. she was doing uh, a lot of bank-owned properties. So she was doing a lot of listings and we were selling those bank owned properties to investors for flips or rentals or whatever. Okay. So I got some good insight into how other people were starting to create wealth through real estate. And I was being their broker and, um, you know, fast forward a couple of years, I recognized that, Hey, I I'm finding these good deals for these other <laughs> investors. I should probably capitalize on them myself versus sure. just, uh, selling it to them. And, so we started a wholesale business and, okay. you know, we, we would do, uh, we'd lock up a contract. We'd sell that contract to another investor for a couple thousand dollar margin. Okay. And, um, and that's how we started. That's how we started growing and doing some wholesales and then growing that business to doing, you know, 15 to 20 deals a month. Okay. Um, and at the end of the year, we'd be paying big, uh, <laughs> checks to uncle Sam. Yeah. And, you know, we just found, you know, it's a good business it's but it is a job it's mm -hmm. it's very active it's very transactional yeah you do a, you do a deal and then you have to go back out and find another deal and find another right. deal. so it, it's a good business to get started in but it wasn't what i envisioned when i read rich dad poor dad <laughs> right it was it was like well this is a good job but this isn't the passive income investment side of things that i really wanted to get involved in right so <clears throat> you know we did that business for about eight years and okay. about four years ago, we made the transition to commercial real estate. And the reason that we did that is we read another great book called Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. <laughs> yep. happens to be 
Kiyosaki's CPA teaching you that the tax code is more than just a book of rules to get you in trouble, but yeah. it's actually a playbook on how to efficiently pay less taxes if mm -hmm. you want to play by their rules. Um, and that was just an aha moment for us. We said, you know, okay. we can we can continue building this business and maybe outpace what we have to pay in 50% in taxes to where we can create some real revenue, or we can create the same amount, maybe a little bit more in revenue, but not pay nearly as much in taxes because we're investing in tax advantaged type of real estate. Mm -hmm. So we built about 400,000 square feet of uh, self storage facilities down in oh, Florida. Wow. Um, and then we've, we've bought and sold about a thousand uh, multifamily units and we're on track hopefully to close about 200 million dollars in transactions this year wow uh, in multifamily deals and some senior and student projects as well okay and is that uh throughout the u.s is it centered more i know you mentioned florida for the self-storage there yeah so we're geographically agnostic i mean where we like to go is where populations are moving right so everybody's bullish on texas everybody's bullish on florida yeah we are as well we like the carolinas some parts of georgia the midwest has some good towns mm -hmm. uh, we can still get some good cash flows and stuff but you know again we're, we're really looking for where populations are moving to where the economics make sense where you see some economic growth and drivers we're not buying in california new jersey and new york or Illinois. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We might do some development deals in those deals in those states, right? Because there's some some opportunities there to uh -huh. get um, just to capitalize on the housing market and the lack of um, supply. But buy and hold, we're typically in the Midwest and Southeast. All right. Sounds good. And I did just want to take a step back because I think this is the first time my listeners have even heard the mention of wholesaling. I plan on having an episode solely dedicated to this in the future, but maybe you can just quickly you know, give my listeners to the first time, this is the first time they've heard of, you know, wholesaling. Maybe you can just give us a quick insight of, you know, what is that? How does it work? And, you know, how did you use it to make uh, your real estate empire grow? Yeah. So, I mean, it's really the lowest barrier to entry okay. as, as far as um, real estate investing goes. So that, that means two things. That means anybody can do it. <laughs> and the problem with that is that anybody can, do, can it. do it. <laughs> So, it, you know, there's a lot of wholesalers out there that get a bad rap because yep. they don't do it properly. But let's just focus on doing it properly, right? And that sure. is finding either an on or off market deal. I know guys that do just MLS deals, right? You can find estate owned properties or bank owned properties on the MLS. And I literally would use to search by term, you know, handyman, fixer upper, bank owned, estate owned, whatever, mm -hmm. right? And then you can find some of these deals that they need work. And then you go in and you just go make offers that make sense. And, you know, you have to understand a little bit about construction costs and you have to understand a little bit about carry costs and things like that. But essentially you tie up this contract and you put your earnest money deposit down and, you know, you can now market that property. You have a financial interest in that property. So now you can market it. So we would build a cash buyers list of other investors that we do flipped property and we would send it out to those guys. We go out and we do a walkthrough and then we take contracts on it and we'd come up with an offering price. So we bought it for a hundred thousand. We'd send it out to people at 120 and, you know, depending on the market, depending on the returns, depending on how well you buy it, you, you can make a margin on, sure. you know, 10, 15, 20, we've done $250,000 wholesales. So there's, um, there's a wide breadth of how to get involved in those types of deals. Um, but again, low barrier to entry, you just need the earnest money deposit essentially and make sure that you either sell that contract or uh, the rights to that contract or kill the contract to yeah. bring your due diligence period so that you don't lose your earnest money. But essentially, that's all it is. You're buying and selling a contract to an investor who's going to come in and pay cash and you make a rip off of it for finding the deal. Sure. So, yeah, and I think and I'm guessing this is where it came from, the wholesaling term, you know, go to a whatever retail store grocery store you know the box of cereal costs a grocery two bucks a box and they resell it for three bucks a box i mean that's basically kind of where it comes it. into it if you can set up that you know steven bought a property for eighty thousand, sells a contract for 100 makes twenty thousand. but that property with a little tlc you know after i don't know say 20 grand maybe it's worth 140 in the market so the end buyer gets 20 grand you get 20 grand the uh, original seller gets a headache off their plate. So I think structured properly, everybody wins. And like you said, you know, unfortunately, if some wholesalers have a bad rap. I mean, I still get postcards 
for just ridiculously low offers on properties I have. And it's like, yeah, you got to be out of your mind, but I'm sure, you know, it's a numbers out, game, right? If exactly. Sending out 100,000 yes. post, postcards, you're going to get one that doesn't know what they're doing or doesn't, isn't educated. And it's like, yeah, sure. I'll sell this hundred thousand dollar property you do for 20,000. And hence yeah. where you get the bad rep. Maybe they us, just need so. to sell it quick and you're the easy button. Right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Most, most people sold to us because we were the easy button. Yeah. You know, so. They didn't want to go through the listing and the showing. And um, so, yeah, there, there's definitely um, a carve out of the market where wholesalers can exist and they can mm-hmm. do their business really well. And hopefully they're providing value to the homeowner and hopefully they're providing value to the investors right. um, that they're selling it to. Yeah. I think if it's a, like you said, win, win, or if everyone wins, that's a good transaction. If there's someone that walks away, you know, the biggest loser, so to speak, then it's not good for all the parties involved. So. Absolutely. Uh, you had mentioned, obviously, with, uh, you know, whether it's the wholesaling and I'm sure fix and flipping, most of my listeners are familiar with from the HGTV shows of, you know, buying a stre- distressed property, you know, slapping on a coat of paint and magically it's worth double what you originally you know paid for it. Obviously, I'm joking. It's not quite that simple. But, you know, with all these transactional uh, pieces, whether it's a wholesaling, whether it's a fix and flip, you know, right off the bat, you're self-employed. So you got 15.2% FICA taxes that go to the government from dollar one. And unlike, you know, your federal income taxes or even state income taxes, there's no exemptions. There's no deductions. It's just you made $100,000, 15200 goes right to the Social Security and Medicare. And then on top of that, you might have your states and local taxes. And then, of course, the federal wage, I think at the time of Recording this, we're at somewhere 38, 39% as the top marginal tax rate. So you just do the basic math there, you know, make $100,000. It's not uncommon. $50,000 is going to go right to Uncle Sam. So in order to truly net $100,000, you have to sell $200,000 and then obviously keep going up and up. Uh, What was kind of the, I know you mentioned at the end of the year, you had to, you know, write a big check in taxes. What was kind of your, I don't know, maybe aha moment or what was kind of the breaking point that you said, you know, gosh, this, you know, why am I working all this to send half of it to Uncle Sam? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's just getting around mentors. You know, we we had other people that were in the space that were saying, hey, you know, there's there's ways to figure out some deductions. And I think everybody knows kind of the reasonable deductions that you can take as a business owner, but there's other things out there, right? I mean, I have a buddy who just bought a single prop plane because it was a write-off um, <laughs> through the IRS. And, you know, you could buy Teslas and you can write those things off. So there's, there's a lot of stuff on the tax code that we probably don't know that, that H&R Block isn't going to tell you about mm-hmm. and not for any other reason than they're not tax advisors, right? They're, right. they're there to do your returns. Mm-hmm. So we just got around people smarter than us. And that's typically been the only way that we've been successful in the past is getting around people smarter than us and saying, hey, how, how do you avoid paying 50% in taxes? Yeah. And then they start selling you, well, you know, you can actually offset some of your taxable gain by investing. And I was like, but that's going to create more gain. And, and then you know, you start understanding how some depreciation works in the tax code. And you can, I mean, last year, my federal tax return was negative $400,000. Nice. (laughs) So it's nice. I mean, until you try to go get a loan, but that's right. That's a story for a different time. But, you know, we, so that's all we did. We got around some other smart people that were, that were doing similar uh, things that we were and showing us how to pay less in taxes. And then we started reading some books and just getting educated on it. And, um, and then, yeah, we just started investing in the things that we knew could create depreciation and create less of a taxable income for us. Mm-hmm. So, well, and I think you hit the nail right in the head. You know, obviously, tax free wealth definitely one of my recommended reads. You know, like Tom Wheelwright has said, you know, the tax code really just a small section that says, this is how much you owe us in taxes and this is what's taxable. And the rest of it, of I don't know, 80,000 pages or whatever the monstrosity actually is, are, you know, sets of rules and deductions and opportunities to lower your tax bill. And, you know, 30,000 foot view as a business owner, if you're providing food, energy, jobs, housing, or, you know, more than one of those, that's where a lot of the tax breaks are. And obviously we're talking about housing in this regard. And, you know, myself personally, I love depreciation. I've, you know, been a real estate investor for six years. 
I was in the same boat with my high paid W2 job. It was every time around in April, it wasn't a matter of, are we paying taxes? It was a matter of, okay, how much do we got to write that check in taxes? And it got very yeah. scary. And, you know, started getting into real estate investing. And, oh, now we're starting to get a couple thousand dollars in refunds. And I think our highest year, if memory serves me right, I think we had a $20,000 refund. It's like, well, geez, there's almost a down payment for another property. So, right. you know, if you get started, you know, get the ball rolling and, you know, can get those tax deductions. And, you know, obviously the, you know, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warrens of the world may not like this, but all this is legal. All this is in the tax code with the blessing. They don't like it, but they IRS. use it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, right. you know, so publicly, they don't like it, but you can also find where they're real estate investors themselves. Yeah. And, you know, it's just the hypocrisy of politics, right? Is like, do as I say, not as I do. Exactly. But the wealthiest people in the world use the tax code to their advantage because the tax code is written in such a way to be advantageous because it helps social programs. Yeah. Right? You're either creating jobs or you're creating good housing. And, you know, the, the whole war on the wealthy in this country that is now taking shape because, everybody has to pay their quote fair share. Yeah. But this tax code has been in place since the fifties, mm -hmm. right? There's been plenty of politicians that have the ability to change it. They don't change it because it actually helps the economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, politics aside, the wh whoever is in charge of helping write and rewrite these tax codes has the ability to change them. Mm -hmm. But the reason that they're written that way is so that it helps uh, the economy and society flourish. Exactly. And I, I know Tom Wheelwright said this numerous times on you know his podcast and speaking engagements. I heard him speak at the Summit at Sand last uh, June in Belize. You know, as far as, you know, taxes go, it really is, you know, here's the book, here's a roadmap. And he's always said, if you want to change your tax, change your facts. And I think so many of us, you know, from K through 12, are just kind of accept that, okay, I make this money, I got to send 20, 30, 40% to uncle Sam. And that's just the way it is. But, you mm -hmm. know, if you start to educate yourself, you know, I, I have myself had a return where I had a negative $400,000 loss. Maybe in the future, I will get that, but you know, there's one tax code for everyone. You know, there isn't a tax code for the quote unquote rich and a tax code for everyone else. It's, exactly. You have to educate yourself. You have to surround yourself with, you know, smarter people. And yeah, maybe someone listening to this, doesn't have the resources or wherewithal to do a, you know, $400 million new construction project, but, you know, maybe they do have $50,000, $10,000 to invest and get a small portion of that through a K1. And okay, I don't have a negative $400,000 loss on my tax returns, but hey, I can use a $4,000 credit and deduct for my taxes. And, you know, what's, it's a, what's it's that? a light switch. Someone? Exactly. You know. Yeah. It's not a light switch, right? It takes time. It takes time to build up depreciation. It takes time to build up a real estate portfolio and, and that's okay. Right. You can start now and grow into that over time. Um, you don't need to have a million dollars to put to work today to, right. to get the benefits of the tax uh, code. Exactly. So, and obviously, you know, the bigger the deals, obviously the bigger the deductions, but you know, all of us can start small with a small investment and, you know, work our way up. So now with that, uh, Steve, you had mentioned, and maybe I can uh, segue into this. I know you're one of the managing partners of Integrity Holdings Group. And obviously you've kind of touched base a little bit on, you know, some of the investments, you know, you know self-storage and multifamily that you've done. Can you do us a, you know, kind of a little bit of a deeper dive as to, you know, what Integrity Holdings are, you know, what you are all invested in, how you start and, you know, maybe kind of lead into can other investors, you know, partner with you in this type of investment. This week's podcast is brought to you by Focus Wealth Group. Do you know you need to get life insurance, but don't know where to start or how much to get? Have you heard of infinite banking, but not sure how it works? Reach out to Barry Brooksby and his team. Barry is not only a mentor, but a friend who has helped me for the past six years in my pursuit of cash flow and financial independence. Their mission is simple. They teach people how to make money and hold on to more money. Learn more and set up your free initial consultation at focuswealthgroup.com. Yeah, so I mean, we've been in business for 11 years now and we've done the wholesaling, we've done flipping, now we moved into commercial. And, <clears throat> you know, so we've done some self-storage, we've done some student housing, we have done uh, multifamily investments. And... Yeah, I mean, so we're syndicators. Essentially, we we basically put together a, a portfolio of properties and 
other investors invest alongside of us. We're investors first. So we're looking at deals as to where we're going to be putting our capital. And then once we find deals with strong operators that are going to come bring us that deal, then we'll fund the deal with our money and with the uh, investors that partner with us. Okay. And, you know, syndication simply is a word that means many hands make life work. <laughs> right? It's just, it, it's pooling time, yeah. money and resources together so that you can buy larger deals than maybe you'd be able to buy on your own. So instead of buying a duplex, people invest with us and, you know, we just bought a 384 unit complex in Daytona Beach. Okay. Right? So $45 million project, that's not something that each of us individually would be able to <laughs> sure. do. But you can do that collectively in a syndication. Mm -hmm. And we manage the investment. We manage the managers. We operate the day-to-day. -day. The investors invest passively alongside of us. They get the tax uh, benefits that we get uh, passed through to them, to them as well. And they just basically get mailbox money. Nice. And then I'm guessing, obviously, come every uh, February, March, then your company then issues all the investors a K-1, which basically says, you know, you put in this much, you receive this much, here's how much you are in taxes. Oh, but here's your portion of the depreciation, the tax write-offs, you know, might be 5% of what the entire project is, but hey, that just flows right to your individual tax return. So you can benefit like the quote unquote rich do. Exactly. Yeah. The last project um, that we did, our average investor took about a 35% K1 loss uh, okay. against their initial investment. Nice. So yeah, 35 cents on the dollar in a negative is nice. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, and, and every deal is different, right? So that, that number fluctuates quite a bit sure, uh, depending on the deal, but that's, that's what we mean by tax advantage. Mm -hmm. So, and now with Tigerty Holdings, like if, you know, say one of our listeners or one of my listeners was interested in this, you know, is there a minimum amount to get in, in there? Do you have to be accredited? Is there a, you know, holding period or does that vary with the, you know, types of investments or funds involved? Yeah. So every fund is different. Every deal is different. You know, the best thing for them to do is go to integrityhg.com and fill out the investor, sign up for the investor club. Okay. The investor club will allow us to get on a phone call with them and kind of understand what their investing goals are and see if we're the best fit. If we're not, we'll be honest with you and just say, Hey, this isn't mm -hmm. going to be a good fit for us, but we like to kind of understand why people are investing, what their experience level is. So both accredited, non-accredited investors have invested with us in the past. Minimums vary per deal. We've done $3 million deals. We've done $7 <laughs> million deals. So, um, you know, all of those things are kind of up, up in the air until we find out exactly who we're talking to and what their investment strategy is. Gotcha. Okay. And then if, uh, I know you mentioned the, uh, obviously take non-accredited or, you know, have 506B syndications available too. As far as an investor, is there kind of like a floor for what the minimum investment is? And then like for saying proper expectations, is there a minimum, you know, three-year hold period before they get their money back or five or seven? Or... Yeah. So we're actually still in the middle of creating the private placement memorandum for our funds. Oh, okay. So th those will be finalized this week, but oh, okay. um, they have not been finalized yet. All right. So again, easiest thing to do is just jump on a call with us and see, I mean, our, our absolute minimum in the past has been 50,000. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't see that changing unless we do like a reg a filing, which I don't sure. think we're going to do. And then, yeah, typically we tell people, you know, three to seven years is the average hold time. And that varies project per project. I think what we're going to be doing in the fund is an initial three year lockup period. Okay. And then they can do an annualized redemption if they so choose, but they just need to give us some time to do that. We're trying to we're trying to shorten the time frame okay. that people have to lock it up. Um, but these deals take time to to yeah. reposition and to create cash flow, so there is some requirement to hold it into the sure. deal so that it gets so that we can capitalize it well. Yeah. So obviously, this one to be your emergency fund or fund that you want to pull from you know, a six month CD in your bank to throw in another six month, obviously this would be a long term. You know, myself personally, I've invested in numerous syndications through my self-directed retirement accounts. You know, if yeah. anyone's interested, you could uh, um, go back to our episode with my interview with Amanda Holbrook of Specialized Trust Services. They've helped hundreds, if not thousands of investors invest in these type of syndications. Downside, if you want to call it in a retirement account, 
you can't get the tax benefits rolled over to your personal return. If you invest outside of your retirement account, obviously you can. Everyone's situation is a little bit different, but hey, if you don't have $50,000 in cash lying around, but you have a $50,000 in your retirement account that you want to get a, you know, just throw on eight to 10%, maybe 12% return in three to seven years, I think that's a win-win without the volatility of the stock market like we've been seeing here as of this recording. I think we're on week four, or week five of the Dow Jones going down. I kind of lost track after a while. <laughs> it's a roller coaster. Exactly. So maybe as Steve, just to kind of finish up, you know, I think how I put this as politically correct as possible. I know a lot of people, politicians, Instagram influencers, you know, they have this perception that, you know, whether it's landlords, business owners, millionaires, et cetera, they're just all evil people and, you know, just trying to make money and screw people over, yada, yada, yada. Obviously, I don't believe that's true. I think you can always find, you know, exceptions to the rule. But in your case with Integrity Holdings, uh, you mentioned that you actually carve out a profit or carve out a small percentage to uh, hand out to nonprofits. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you're giving back to the communities that you invest in? Yeah, so I mean, our tagline is invest with purpose. And what that means for us is the heart behind the business is that we're not just growing our own wealth, right? We're, we're blessed in the sense that we have a great business that creates a lot of cash flow and income for not only ourselves, but our investors. And, uh, and because of that, we, you know, we're mission oriented in, in that we want to fund nonprofits around the world. So it started off as a small percentage. You know, I think the first deal that we did, we carved out 1% and then it grew to two and then it grew to four. And now the last deal is 20%. Wow. So we're, we, we like to give till it hurts and it doesn't come out of our investors, uh, return profile. It comes out of our business profile, our big, hairy, audacious goal. If you've read books that talk about BHAGs, is eventually we'd like to be able to give 80% of our net revenue away oh, wow. to nonprofits. And, you know, we, we, giving is the heart behind the business. So we want to be generous and abundant um, outside of ourselves within the communities that we're investing in. And then also with, uh, with nonprofits that are, you know, serving people around the world. We're helping save girls from sex trafficking in the Philippines. We're digging wells in Western Africa. Um, we're feeding people in Ukraine right now. Uh, wow. During the invasion, we put uh, we put several hundred Afghani refugees on a plane the day that the Afghani Air Force uh, shut down the base in Bagram. Um, so we've been able to do some amazing things through our partners and just be able to write the checks to be able to help those partnerships uh, flourish and, and go help some people around the world. And, you know, there's no shortage of need in the world. Mm-hmm. And if we can make a dent in that, then that's kind of what we want to do. And our investors get to partake in that blessing alongside of us because they're making good returns, but they're also getting updated as to what uh, their dollars are going towards as well. So, Mm -hmm. well, yeah, if you can make a good return and, you know, do good in the world, I think it was Jim Rohn, the quote, you can get everything in life that you want as as long as you can help enough people get what they want in life. And obviously, you know, whether helping, you know, refugees, helping, you know, people get wells or basic, basic needs, I think, Unfortunately, there's no shortage of needs out there and definitely commendable for what you and Integrity Holdings are doing to, you know, pass on 20, you know, percent and hopefully up to even 80 percent of your net revenue. That is uh, very, very admirable and hope you get there. <laughs> Appreciate that. So, well, good. Well, as we're getting close to wrapping up here, is there uh, anything maybe I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to let my listeners know that you're working on or uh, what's coming up down the pipeline in 2022? No, I mean, we're launching a couple of funds that will be investing in all kinds of deals uh, around the country. Um, You know, we're focused very much this year on, you know, relationship building and helping our, um, not just our investors, but our our people that work for us be intentional about kind of their why, right? I think entrepreneurs often talk about their why. um, And, you know, I just had a good friend of mine, Jim Shields on on our podcast recently. And he talks about um, the family board meeting and he owns a company called 18 summers. And it's really just as entrepreneurs, how we tell ourselves this entrepreneurial lie, which is everything that I do, I do for my family while at the same time, leaving your family behind. Yep. <laughs> and I think it's very easy to get caught in that cycle of I'm grinding for my family and then mm-hmm. don't give to them uh, what they need in terms of time and intentionality. 
So, you know, that's, that's something that we've been talking about a lot recently with our kids, with my wife, um, with all of our employees, and even with our investors now, like, hey, why are you investing, right? Mm -hmm. If the goal of investment is to give you time, how are you being intentional about that time and putting it on the calendar and exactly. making sure that you're carving out the time that your family needs and wants? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think it goes back a lot to that. If you can think about your why and do the seven layers of why, right? So it's like, I'm investing so I can get passive income. Why? Mm -hmm. well, I want passive income so that I can work less. Why? Yeah. I want to work less <laughs> so I can do this. Why? Right. Mm -hmm. And ask yourself seven layers of why, and then you'll get down to the real reason of what that why is. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that I can say is that what gets calendared gets done. Mm -hmm. So if you're not putting date nights on the calendar, if you're not putting time with your kids on the calendar, if you're not putting vacations on the calendar, if you're not putting these things on the calendar, they will slip by, they will not get done. You know, I think uh, a lot of us were raised in maybe some environments where spontaneity was something that was um, admired, like, oh, that's good that we get to just hang out whenever, yeah. get to call me whenever. You know, I, I would argue that the opposite is true, right? That, that people are important and things are important enough to get put onto your calendar so that you're intentional about getting them done. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just something that we've been talking through since the beginning of this year and we'll continue talking through it, so. Cool. So, and uh, last question, I apologize for not mentioning this or uh, bringing this up before. What is the name of your podcast that you do? Oh yeah. So we do a podcast called free from wall street. Free from wall street. Okay. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously we're just talking about how to get off the roller coaster of the stock market, <laughs> at least a portion of your portfolio. And, and that was born from my dad. You know, he lost about half of his wealth in the downturn of 2007, 2008, and then he passed away. Oh, so he didn't get to ride the market back up. And honestly, none of us know when the music stops. So yeah. if you can diversify yourself into some alternative assets and some, some things over here where it's not as volatile. I mean, uh -huh. if he lived for another two years, he would have recouped all of that cash. Right. He didn't. Right. So <clears throat> market volatility, I think is something that all of us in real estate talk about and maybe in a way that makes people feel like we're trying to pitch them on something. But mm -hmm. the fact is, is that, the market over time does make returns, right? Six yeah. to 8% consistent returns in the S&P 500, which is a great return over time. Mm -hmm. The problem that people don't talk about is volatility, right? Yeah. And if you just Google volatility calculator, um, it will really open your eyes as to how volatility hurts your long-term returns, mm -hmm. right? So everybody talks about dollar cost averaging and six to 8% consistent returns over time, over 30 or 40 years. Well, that's fine. But, you know, like you just talked about the stock market's down however much today, you know, what's interesting is that if you lose 20% on $100,000 in one day, mm -hmm. you don't have to make 20% tomorrow to get back to even, right? Yep. You have to make 25%. Exactly. So the cost of volatility is real and it's mathematically something that you can figure out, but most of us overlook it because we're dollar cost averaging. So exactly. I would just say, you know, think about those types of things when you're hedging against long-term volatility and your legacy is what you're working towards, right? And whether that's your legacy for yourself or retirement or the legacy for your kids or your grandkids, that volatility is going to cost you money and God forbid you're mm -hmm. on the bottom when the music stops. And exactly. Your legacy gets hurt. And if you don't have downside protections in place, it's just a virtue of education. Exactly. And yeah, I'm a big fan of diversification and not diversification, meaning I have growth stocks, international stocks, bonds, uh, income, dividend paying stocks, et cetera. You know, obviously real estate, paper assets, commodities, et cetera. Um, you know, true diversification that I think the you know, top 1% and a lot of successful people out there actually, you know, work at day in and day out. So that was good. Well, for anyone listening, uh, all these uh, resources we mentioned from the podcast, Free From Wall Street to Tax-Free Wealth, the famous purple book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that will all be in the show notes for you to uh, click on. So if you're driving or working out while listening to this, you don't need to scramble for a pen and paper and hit the rewind button to find that. So uh, with that, Stephen, I appreciate you coming on to the show and hope that my listeners gain some valuable insight from your journey. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Be sure to share, rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For more updates, check out www.wealthandfreedomnexus.com.
Remember, nothing on this show should be considered tax, legal, investment, or professional advice. This show is produced solely for educational and informational purposes. Please consult an appropriate and licensed tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for specific advice for your situation. For distribution or publication rights or media interviews, please contact the host.